Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Our guest today is Jim DeFelice. He's got more than a dozen New York Times bestsellers, many of them a celebration of unsung American heroes. In fact, he's like the Dr. Dre of American literature. Just like when a record label thinks you really got something and it's time for you to turn it on, they send you to Dr. Dre and he locks the door behind you and you sequester for a month and then emerge with a life-changing piece of work under your arm. Well, Jim is that for someone with a harrowing life. He will pull it out and shine a light on it from all directions. And when that story emerges, we're all gripped, captivated, enraptured, enlightened, and inspired. He's done it with the likes of Omar Bradley, Richard Marcinko, Chris Kyle, Ivan Castro, and Johnny Walker. Today, Jim's back to talk with us about the new book he's co-written with Ray Lambert, who stormed Omaha Beach in the first wave at Normandy on D-Day. Jim has spent time with some real American heroes, but this story, even among all of theirs, is really special. The book is called Every Man a Hero, and we know you're going to love it. Of course, if you're a longtime listener, you know Jim. He's a great guy, an amazing ally, and someone whose work and work ethic and friendship we absolutely treasure. In addition to Every Man a Hero, if you haven't already, you should buy his previous book, West Like Lightning, The Brief Legendary Ride of the Pony Express, one of my all-time favorite books and so much fun to read. As always, if you dig the show, please help us out. It takes just a minute to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications if you're listening to the show on YouTube. Or give us that five-star rating and quick review if you're listening on iTunes or Stitcher. Those things help the show's profile, and we love you for doing it and for listening in. And now, our guest today, our dear friend, we love him. You're going to love him, too. Here's Jim DeFelice. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. Is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hey, this is Jim DeFelice. I'm the co author of Every Man a Hero, which is an incredible story. A true story of combat medic Ray Lambert uh, during World War II, especially uh, some of his exploits on D-Day. And you are listening to the Break It Down Show. And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Jim has been on many times. Uh, obviously, every time he writes a book, we have him on. <laughs> also, though, co-hosting a number of times. And so I'm honored to call you my friend, to have you on the show with me, to have a copy of your book sitting here in my lap, Every Man a Hero. I just got it yesterday, and I'm already about halfway through it. So uh, I will tell everybody in the audience, if you like reading books at all, especially about World War II, you have to get this book. Ray's story, first wave. When they drop that first Higgins boat gate, Ray is right there with everybody going out first. And he's spent, right at the front. Yeah. Right in the front. He's, he goes out, he gets hit, and he gets hit right away. Uh, and then spends the whole day, as long as he's able, until he, he's absolutely overcome by injuries. But that injury didn't stop him. He just kept going and going and going. And it's not just running up to bodies on the beach. You know, the whole book, Jim, starts off with, you know, next thing you know, he's already in the water, going underwater and helping someone get detangled from barbed wire and you know it's just incredible he was a, he he's still he, he's an incredible guy he's still with us he's 98 years old still drives not wow. with me i drive but <laughs> he's an incredible guy and on d-day by by the time of d-day he had actually already been in two of the biggest invasions of the war in africa and in sicily and he had two silver stars already so I guess in some sense, you know, he had been preparing, his whole service was preparing for that day. And yet, uh, incredible, you know, he's hit right away. Uh, he struggles, gets to the gets to the beach. And then, not to give the entire book away, but, uh, you know, he, he, at some point, he says, I can't go on. And then he's forced to go on, and he does go on. It's, uh, he's he's uh, quite a guy. Yeah, 98 years old, and actually he was there at the Normandy Remembrance, the 75th anniversary, and Donald Trump, the president, actually mentioned a significant portion of his speech was was 
referring to Ray, and Ray was sitting right behind him. Absolutely. And you know, if I didn't know any better, I would swear that he was just reading off the uh, the inside cover of our book because uh, he summarized a lot of uh, just you know with someone like Ray, you know, you can't really sum up their their whole life in you know 60 seconds or or whatever i mean so many so many different things happened and it wasn't just ray i mean the combat medics you know in general certainly on that day and throughout the war and throughout history but in world war ii they saved hundreds and hundreds of men Uh, ray was in charge he was a staff sergeant in charge of about 30 uh men during the war and so, you know, you, you know, you think about it in any of the in any given battle, you know, each guy probably saves a dozen, a couple dozen people. You know, you multiply that by 30 and then multiply it by all the battles they were in. I mean, you know, thousands and thousands of people owe their lives to these guys. You know, I was thinking on Father's Day, you know, as families, you know, would gather together with their fathers, you know, also in the room with Ray weren't just his I mean, literally his descendants, but figuratively all of the descendants, the, you know, the children of the guys who made it back because of him and because of his men, Uh, just incredible. Yeah. So he lands on Omaha beach. And again, we don't want to give the book away. You guys really have to buy it. And the standard thing applies when you guys go to Amazon and buy the book, rate it, review it. That's what gets the book held up in front and and recommended to other people. It's already going to be a bestseller if it's not already. And it's actually, it is, it is, of course, it'll be on the times list. It's well, it's on the times list that comes out Sunday. It's, uh, it's doing very well. And I have to say, yeah, it's all Ray. It's not, it's not me, but yes, it's all Ray. It's Ray's story, but you're the master of this, of taking these stories and processing them in a way for us. So it's for sure Ray's story, but man, you're the master at, at co-authoring and getting us to a place that, you know, I just have the highest regard for what you do, like with Johnny Walker in his book. That's not an easy book to write. So you don't get out yeah, of that. Johnny, easy. Well, uh, yeah, Johnny's, uh, Johnny keeps me on my toes. Johnny and I actually are spe- we're doing, uh, we're doing a talk uh, for uh, a VFW, big VFW meeting this weekend. So, uh, and we, we still do a lot of, a lot of stuff together, John. Everybody is different. I mean, it's really, it's kind of an interesting thing, you know, to, to kind of meet, to meet different people, you know, people from say Dave Batista to, uh, to Chris, Chris Kyle, to Johnny Walker, to, uh, you know, to Ray, to Ray Lambert, you know, you get, you don't have you don't have to be their friend to to be able to to do the book and sometimes you have to you know you have to ha- make decisions and help them make decisions that aren't necessarily the easiest thing for for them but it's been my privilege to be able to form fairly good friendships with most if not everybody that I've worked with and you know they're always they're always interesting they're always keeping you on your toes i'll tell you that yeah yeah well but you so you've covered a number of wars in your writing i mean obviously the omar bradley book is sort of a i, I guess i haven't read it but the one i look at the title it, it's you know about the man so it definitely covers some world war ii but it covers other things you've got ray you've got johnny walker who's the most improbable seal of all time chris kyle of course when you hear these things you've even it's not really a combat story but it is you know the story of uh, uh we had john for west like lightning you know the pony express book and it's these these primarily these men that take on these incredible challenges how do how do they when you kind of sift them through time how do you see a difference between ray and johnny and chris and uh, you know someone who's writing the pony express they all have different favorite drinks and, you know, I'm very adaptable. So there, um, I think that on the surface, there's obviously, you know, there's always obvious differences. I mean, Johnny Walker, Johnny's Johnny was an Iraqi and pretty contemporary times you know, raised in, <laughs> in Iraq, much different background, say than Chris Kyle was a, who was a tried and true Texan and very different. All those guys are very different that, then Ray, Ray Lambert, who, you know, was, had been born in Alabama before the war and certainly comes from, I mean, America has certainly changed quite a bit since 1920 when he was born. But the thing that I see, one thing that kind of ties all of these guys together for me is 
that they deal with, they've all dealt with, um, they've all dealt with very difficult circumstances and they've all managed to kind of reach deep and, and come through. And each one of them, I think, would tell you that in their heart of hearts, they don't think that they're very special. Yeah. Chris, Chris was adamant about that. Ray is very insistent. It took months. I have to tell you, it took months and months and months to get Ray to agree to, to, to do the book because he didn't think, you know, it's like, well, nobody's going to want to read it. It's not, it was no big deal. I was just doing my job. Right. You know, my job was not a good, you know, was a difficult one, but you know, that's what I was doing. And Johnny, Johnny's Johnny, Johnny. <laughs> <pretty unique. laughs> yeah. I know he's read the book. I know he's, <laughs> he's worked quite a lot on it. But again, you know, he's just a, an ordinary guy. And, and yet they, have, they were called on or, or put into situations where they had to do extraordinary things. Yeah. And I, I think that's a, an endlessly fascinating you know, subject. And, it, you know, some people say some people are inspired by heroes and other people say, well, you know, I read this story and it's great, but I can never be that way. And, you know, I think that the message that comes through for me anyway, in reading in working with all of these men uh, and women, Taya Kyle did her memoir and we've worked on some things together that ordinary people can rise to the occasion. Maybe not all of us. And hopefully we're not all placed in, in the di- some of the di- most dire situations that make good, good drama, good books, good movies, maybe. But, you know, I certainly wouldn't wish some of the things, any of the things really that happened uh, to Ray. Yeah during the war on other people, but they all managed to just kind of go beyond. Yeah. Find that, that thing, whatever, whether it's a, uh, a thumb of, of a rock on a beach in Omaha or, you know, however, Johnny, gosh, I don't even know how Johnny did it. I was actually able to talk to beta Johnny's wife and uh-huh, feature yeah. some of her story on the show. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. A- and it's just impossible. You know what she had to go through. And I asked her a question and I asked her specifically because I knew, I had a sense of what the answer would be, but I phrased it. I said, you know, how many times in a month was you and your kids, like your livelihood, your lives outside of your control? And she kind of laughed, as you might expect, and said two to three times a day. Yeah, I was going to say it'd be like every day, you know, 100 percent. She we have a great there's a great story in uh, Codename Johnny Walker uh, about when they finally leave Mosul, basically escape uh, Mosul. And that story, Johnny had not heard. The first time Beta told me that story was in her kitchen. We were standing around. We started talking. Johnny had not heard that story before. Right. He didn't know that that they had been, the the bus that they were on had been stopped yeah. by Mujahideen. And, uh, you know, they were, you know, basically sweating out their their lives for a couple of hours there. Like I say, I would not wish yeah. <laughs> I would not wish those circumstances on anyone, but I find the fact that uh, that people like Johnny and Chris and Ray, you know, have kind of risen above those things, have gotten through. Yeah. The one thing that they all seem to say is that when things were most difficult, they weren't thinking about themselves. They were thinking about, you know, in, in Ray's case, the guys that he was going to save. He you know, had reached a point he'd or been shot or hit by, by shrapnel. It wasn't clear which, you know, a couple of times on the beach and was ready to collapse. And yet he kept going because he, he heard other people, you know, crying for help and right. that sort of thing. And, you know, that does make him a phenomenal man, makes him obviously a hero and an inspiration for us. And hopefully, you know, God forbid we're ever in that situation, but hopefully, you know, whatever sparked him will spark us as well. Yeah. You've written the book, uh, The Rangers at Dieppe, also uh, another D-Day landing story. How did that inform your tale with Ray? Well, one thing I learned from Rangers at Dieppe, which is about the first, actually, it's the first action that the U.S. Army takes on the ground in Europe, let alone the Rangers. And they had just been kind of invented and they were still being stood up and the rangers go with the canadians and the uh, the british on the attack uh the one thing the one 
real lesson I learned uh, in doing that book, I think, is that history has, as, as uh, maybe my college professors probably tried to drum into my, into my head, but history has different perspectives. And when you go and you read the after action reports from that battle, and if there were four men who were engaged in the same area, the same engagement, the same little acres of combat, they each did a report and there were four different versions of the battle and <laughs> yeah. figuring out what really happened and, and that can be a bit tricky. And that's before you get to the commandos and their version. One of the kind of themes in that book was trying to locate the actual falling place of the first American in, you know, on the ground in Europe and the difficulty in trying to pin that down. And, and that, you know, I think that for me is a metaphor about, about history and truth and that we have to keep trying to come to terms with history and yet we can never be 100% sure that we get it right. So we have to go back and back and try and, you know, kind of try and place things in our mind whether it's where somebody fell, where a grave might be, or really what that event and what that war not only means meant in the past, but what it means for us and what lessons we can draw. I was struck by your opening, and this is specifically written by you for the book. And you try to, you know, like everybody, you try to capture in words something that is just undescribable. And uh, you're very detailed with with how everything starts. Zero hour plus 15. So for those that don't know, like that's 15 minutes out. That's it. It's about 6.15, 6.30 on D-Day. Yeah. Right. Oh, let me actually to say this. You have it at 6.45 in the book. So okay, it's 6.45. Zero, 6.45. <laughs> and I'll cut the other stuff out. Okay, so zero, 6.45. And you start taking your shot at doing sort of the... Um, what all of the directors and all of the writers try to do was that on purpose that you like, like I really want to try to explain this, how you've seen it. Cause you've seen it through the eyes of Ray and his peers that you were able to talk to. Yeah. I wanted, to, you know, I wanted to set the scene. I wanted to throw people right in there. It's, you know, from the beginning and that was not something that I could do actually with Ray's voice at that point. Cause I hadn't, because Ray's voice is not established in the book and Ray doesn't really doesn't talk the way that intro uh, sounds. So that's why I kind of reverted to third person there. And in a couple of the books I've changed, you know, I've used different strategies to kind of somewhat, not that they're radical, but somewhat unconventional, mm. putting Taya Kyle's voice into uh, American Sniper, for instance, had not been done certainly in a SEAL book to that extent. But I think that you know, for effect, you know, when it works, it works. And sometimes you have big arguments with, uh, you know, with your editor or whatever, but, you know, if you, you, know, you win some. Yeah. You, know, you get one. I wanted people, you know, I wanted to throw people in there. I mean, it's such a dramatic time. If you've seen Saving Private Ryan, you know, Ray is about a, I don't know, maybe somewhere at 75, 100 yards to uh, Tom Hanks's left, somewhere in there. Yeah. I went through the same. You know, it's actually a different sector on that on that beach, it's, but you know, going through the same hell, and, um, and I think it's important. It, you know, the, a lot of the people who are reading the book are people whose uh, fathers and grandfathers, and you know, great uncles, and, and how that works. They were in the war, and um, a lot of the correspondence that we've been getting, emails texts and, and that sort of stuff, you know, have, have talked about the fact that, you know, they were always wondering their parents or their grandparents, uh, their ancestors did not tell them, you know, what had happened there. And they were you know, grateful for Ray for telling his story so that they, you know, had a better understanding and, and, and you know, and saw it. And, and that's what I'm trying to do with the prose and that, you know, in that part of the book is, you know, paint a picture so that you can kind of throw yourself into you know into the past and also understand you know who ray is ray ray (laughs) ray will not say that he was a hero but i can say he was a hero and he was (laughs) yeah 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 what is it about that generation that has given them that because we i think we've learned and evolved where hero status aside you know our comfort in telling our story you know chris didn't 
Kyle didn't start out wanting to tell the story, but it started coming out. Have we learned that it's better to get these things out sooner, do you think? Is is this an evolution or is it just, just a difference between generations? Well, I think there's a couple of things going on there. Uh, you know, one one is it's it's a very different time. Ray, as you know, the same with Omar Bradley. I mean, they're very adverse to doing anything that would sound like bragging or you know, or kind of advertising themselves. They're very uh, judicious about that, very tight lip. Uh, and that's just, and it's not, you know, it's that entire generation. America is a different, much different place. It's the turn of the 19th to 20th century. They have a totally different understanding of media. Obviously, there's nothing, you know, uh, Instagram, no, uh, you know, Twitter, whatever. Uh, cameras are hard to, you know, even cameras that, in those days are hard to come by. Yeah, they're they're cumbersome. They totally different understanding, and you know about putting themselves out. You know, the other thing too, though, is as Ray, you know, and, and you know, there's a lot more to raise life than just the war, and there's a lot more to every soldier that was in the war. Yeah, you know, and by the time I think that we start to engage, you know, um, my grandfather was in World War One, and by the time I you know, was old enough to even, you know, to even know that there had been a war, you know, it's 40 years, more than 40 years after the end of the war. And, you know, he's had 40 years of life and other stuff going on. And, you know, he's got other stuff to talk about, mm -hmm. you know, I, you know, how the Yankees are doing, you know, I mean, you know <laughs> great, you know, by the way, <laughs> sort of thing. So, you know, so you have to, you know, kind of sit down and pull it out of them. But in one thing though, in, in that we, I think that, there's kind of a consensus now in, in terms of, to back up a second, war, obviously, as you certainly can attest, changes, changes you. And you're, you know, any, any dramatic experience is going to have uh, an effect on who you are, and war is about as dramatic as you can get. And you know, I would say probably the vast majority of of men and women coming back from that kind of experience, you know, may have difficulty adjusting in, in certain ways. And one thing that, that seems to be kind of accepted now is that it helps to adjust to those things. It helped, or to, I shouldn't say that, to adjust to, to regular life again, it helps to talk about the things that you've been through. That's not necessarily an easy thing, especially given the emotions uh, that can be very complex. And I don't want to turn this into a, you know, into a dialogue about, you know, post-traumatic stress or anything like that. Yeah. But, uh, but I think that kind of the, the attitudes towards that and towards encouraging people to talk about their experiences has also had an effect on our generation in terms of, yeah, I was in the war and this is what I did. I think we're much more ready to, to talk about that and understand that it's not bragging, unlike someone like, you know, Ray at the time who yeah. didn't really talk that much about it. He also didn't have, they didn't have the communication formats that we have now. They didn't have podcasts. Yeah. <laughs> didn't have podcasts. Well, in general, I mean, the amount of communication, yes, the world had phones and all those kind of things, but you're talking about a farm kid from Alabama. And like he says, right in the beginning of the book, like, there just there weren't that many doctors around. There, you know, there weren't phones in every house in every room. You know, and that, and heck, that's a generation ago now that you have phones in every room. Uh, you did say in couple, every pocket, right? every I pocket, mean, no, yeah, they're every everywhere. Pocket. I mean, you know, my phone. Think about it. My phone goes everywhere. Yeah, my phone and my laptop are with me everywhere, and both of those things, in effect, are our phones. But, and you uh, don't have to crank it as in this day. <laughs> crank it, and <laughs> Ethel, could uh -huh. you get me? Yeah. yeah, Klondike six one five. Yeah. Although I guess with Siri, you know, I don't know, I'm thinking about it. Well, maybe Siri is just kind of a you know the <laughs> modern, the contemporary incarnation of those uh, yeah. those operators. And that. she is listening, just like operators did. She's always listening. <laughs> you said a couple of things that are important to to hit on, and things that I've come to realize as a, as a podcaster. We we had on Harold Bray, who survived the USS Indianapolis sinking in World War II, right at the very end of the Pacific fight. And he's still with us today. He's also 90 plus years old. And I realized I wanted to get and I wanted to tell that story. But I realized about halfway through the show, he's told the story a thousand times. And he's forced to constantly relive the five shittiest days of his life over and over again, because we can't just get enough of it. We like We just... 
were, were, were captured by it. Into that episode, and I think you'll appreciate this, and, and I want to bring this back over to Ray's, he was talking about the whole ordeal of being out in the ocean for five days, finally getting rescued, wanting to be nowhere near water for a long time. And then right at the end, he was kind of contemplative, and he said, you know, I, I never told my folks. They died without knowing that that had happened to me. Yeah. And as a combat guy, especially understanding that generation a little bit, I got it because you wouldn't want to stand out. There are so many of your peers that had gone, so many parents that actually lost kids and you just didn't want to, like, it wasn't about, it wasn't about Harold in that moment. And so as a combat guy, I'm shooting right past that. And John smacks me in the arm and says, shut up and listen to what he just said. You know, his parents never knew Mm -hmm. what a crazy thing. Cause that wouldn't, I don't think that could happen today. I don't know about that, though. I, I think that, you know, if you ran into, you know, if you ran into a burning car, or tried to pull somebody out, would you tell your and your parents, you know, and that happens and then it's weeks later and, you know, your parents aren't in the greatest health or whatever. Would you would you be talking about that to them or would you be talking about something else? I, yeah, it's complex. I, you know, it's um, and I'm not comparing, you know burning car to being you know in combat for six months or 12 or in, in ray's case for th- uh three well actually four years really if you think about it but there you know it, one thing you say you know he's forced to you know the the survivors sometimes in telling the stories they're you know they've told them before and they're kind of reliving them and reliving them and that's a point that that's a really good point i saw that you know with chris because obviously he had to relive, he relived a lot of what he had done in the war with me for the first time. And, uh, you know, and that would, then the, the, the toll that that took, I think was, she was huge. And at first I didn't really understand that, but then there comes a, you know, a, a time, you know, when the book comes out and all of a sudden the book's doing well and you're a celebrity and things things really can get crazy, and there can be a really you know can really take a toll on you. And Ray started getting you know a huge kind of an avalanche of requests for interviews and stuff, and he just had to you know I kept telling him it's okay, you know, it's okay, yeah. you don't have to do everything. But of course, the the problem with Ray is you would tell Ray, you know, you don't have to do everything. Oh, you know, I have to be nice to the blah 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 blah. It's like okay, well, give this person ten minutes. That's it. Oh, I can't give them ten minutes. I can't, you know, the, you know, they, you know, it takes more than ten minutes to, to, you know, to, to tell them what happened. So, you know, I think innately in his in his case, anyways, just he's a really nice guy. Yeah, <laughs> that kind of that put even more strain on him. The other thing I was realizing is in talking to Harold, you know, one of his common themes he talks about this the instant before. You know, the ship gets blown up. He's laying on the deck, looking at the stars and just trying to be trying not to be down by the engine room and hot. So he's up up top and he's, you know, a lot of guys are sleeping up there. And then the torpedo hits, the ship lists, and he watches his shoes fall into the ocean. You know, and it's uh, it struck me as such a crystal clear memory for him that he's kept all this time. I, I know that when I step my foot into a combat zone. My first thought is just to kind of center myself. I look down at my shoes like, okay, I'm really here. I, I put my feet side by side and I go, okay, it, it's, you know, what, even if you're getting out of a vehicle for a combat patrol, if at all possible, that's what I do to sort of center myself and really? remember my rules for combat. Did, did Ray have those things where you're like, that's a, such a curious thing to hold on to for the last 75 years? I think that there are certain memories that he holds on to very, very tightly. The guy that almost sliced up his hand and almost killed him with a bayonet, certainly. It's, that's really, he, he's told that story to his family and I think to some military people before. And that's a really vivid thing. He still has very much in his mind. Some of the stuff that happened on D-Day, very vivid. Some of the other things, it's interesting that we would talk about some some of the incidents that happened, and it would be difficult because remember now, I mean, the war, you know, he was in his early 20s when, you know, when the war took place It's 75 years, you know, it's 75 years later, so so much has happened. He would remember, like, incidents or events, but the context around them, 
was sometimes difficult for for him to you know, to know until uh, and that's really where documents and, and stuff really became very very valuable in, in doing this book. There were two times, two times where he um, went into my at least two times. He, there may have been others, but two times where I know of that he rescued people from from minefields. Yeah, where he went in. And the first time is fairly is fairly vivid. And by the way, medical records help pin those down. But the first time was was very vivid. The second time, first that, that when he first described it to me, it was like, "Oh yeah, I went into another minefield." <laughs> that, oh, that okay. Was so, so that's easy. Oh, yeah. Oh, right. Okay. Well, and where was that, right? <laughs> I don't know. It was somewhere in there. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. <laughs> So um, I guess that one, you know, wasn't, but, but when we kind of went into the actual description of it, it was pretty, uh, pretty harrowing, but, um, but I guess the, I guess the first time you go into a minefield, that's, that's the big, uh, that's the big one. I don't know. I, I just, uh, <laughs> I just, I'm amazed. That, <laughs> yeah. You know, just looking at the minefield, let alone running into it. Well, I mean, it's, 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 uh, I think one of the things that has given me PTSD was, was when I went to Bosnia, our helicopter broke to the point where it could still fly but needed to go home immediately and i was on the helicopter and so like hey we're gonna drop you off and keep going so that you know nobody crashes so it, a bit of emergency but nothing nothing crazy and they dropped me off at the helipad the helipad was well outside the bounds of the camp and normally you came down on a patrol and they patrolled back and mm -hmm. you know you were relatively safe there was no party to greet me there and we were briefed that there were 15 bazillion mines all throughout, un unmapped. And I spent the next, I don't know, hour hour or so, you know, and I, was, I had kids around me. That was good. But I was worried about mines. I was also worried about becoming the butcher of fill in the blank place where I was at. Mm -hmm. And just a constant stress because I was uh, doing this solo combat patrol. And literally no one ever came. I walked all the way up and they're like, what are you doing outside? I'm like waiting on someone to come get me. But you know, that caused thank, a lot. Thank of God you, you could see where you had to go. That's yeah. The, you know, yeah. The there was a road and I was you could be going the wrong way. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, the path was known, but it didn't make it any less terrifying because I was like, what if someone has come and placed something? So I'm scanning every single thing for patterns of, you know, and so just, I, I think now about Ray, going into a uh, a minefield and that's burned into my mind i can tell you tons of memories from that specific thing and uh but you can't remember everything right and so it's like yeah it was a minefield i ran in and i i grabbed this guy and you know all was well so ray had more than one d-day let's talk a little bit about that this episode of the break it down show is brought to you by lions rock productions that's us we publish evaluate and develop podcasts just like this one consult others to build their own and create associated content and content marketing strategies so if you're launching or expanding your social media presence your business or your personal brand or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level reach out to us on twitter at p day turner or at John LG69. At the Break It Down show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. So Ray had more than one D-Day. Let's talk a little bit about that. He lands in, in Africa. And that landing is actually, as amphibious landings go, Yeah, that was a relatively easy landing. I wouldn't say it was unopposed, but there was very, very light, uh, light combat around it. But it was also the introduction for most, including Ray, Americans into combat. And the first, you know, in the the they come on on land, and um, you know, and they have two two guys uh, get lightly wounded, and then as they're going uh, towards their objective, they see a bunch of. I'm gonna. I'll leave out some of the details, but one of the highlights for me is they see a, a bunch of bodies in kind of a ditch by the by the water and one of the guys goes to goes to touch it and almost gets electrocuted because the uh, it was you know live live uh, i guess the power lines had been knocked down and, and uh, that's apparently how the that for those fellows had died and i think 
that was the first that's kind of the 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 combat in africa uh, which is called operation torch is the, the landing mm. is often something that's kind of brushed past if you're talking about world war ii i doubt that it's taught in any sort of any high school classes about it and probably not many many college level classes it's not in a lot of books not very famous battles but it was very important because it's the first time you know Large groups of Americans, they, as I had said earlier, they, uh, very small groups of Americans had fought in Dieppe a few months before. But this is the first time that Americans are starting to see what war is really like. And the uh, American operations there continue, and Ray is end up going east into Tunisia. But before that happens, or actually I should say in the process of that happening, since we're talking about the entire army, the American army gets it gets its ass kicked. Yeah. In a series of battles. And again, that's something else we don't talk about. Yeah. But that kind of ushers in that that helps well, actually that gets Omar Bradley sent over to uh to Africa to find out what the hell is going on. It gets uh Patton right up there and Patton will eventually Patton and Bradley actually eventually take over. And yeah, you know, the war starts to turn. Bradley was asked about immediately actually several times immediately afterwards and then much after the war you know what happened with the you know, the americans why did we not do well in the you know in that first phase of the of the action and while obviously there's going to be you know yes technical answers is he's actually a great tactician and blah 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 he kind of boils it down generally to one thing he said that americans had not learned to kill. They didn't know to, you know, to kill. They, they, we had not yet realized what war really is all about. Mm. And, um, and it, it, until we did that, no amount of leadership from the front, which is another big Bradley thing, um, you know, no amount of you know, uh, doctrine yeah. in terms of using artillery and, and mobility, et cetera, all of that was useless until we kind of had that, killer instinct that we're able to to get over it and um and i think that that's something that we don't necessarily you know have or we don't want to recognize today yeah and i think that a lot of us who have not been in war you know kind of have these kind of hollywood ideas about it but when we're kind of faced with the, with the reality of it we're not willing to to deal with that reality and um you know that's 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 a problem and it, it's a re and you know war what's the cliche war is hell yeah which is a good reason to stay out of out of it when you can prevent it or or not you know when it's not necessary but when it is necessary and when you do have to fight you got to fight for the end you got to kill people that's your job when i watch or i and i typically memorial day and several other times a year i, I try to remember you know, people that have gone before us in terms of veterans and I'll, I'll read medal of honor citations and, you know, just spend some time in that history, just being familiar with it. And you know, I'm always struck by, you know, these people, especially in world war two, where they're just indomitable. And, and like you said, they're thinking they're pushing forward despite their wounds, not for themselves, not their own preservation, but to, to not let their brother and sister down to, to, you know, fight off the enemy. And if someone has to go, it may as well be me and they fight these impossible things. And I, and then I put myself in the, the shoes of the enemy, you know, some, some German kid who sees this American kid who's just indomitable, who they shoot and they blow him up and he just keeps getting up and keeps coming and killing him. And that has to just be, morally breaking if they survive that incident. And I don't know, I, I'm positive it's not unique to America, but I, I wonder what it's like to be up against, you know, the guys on Paleo, you know, the, the guy that hand fired a, you know, a gigantic machine gun, you know, indefinitely and just smoking his arm and, and, you know, basically couldn't do it again without the, the amped up nature of, of combat. But when I, when I hear those tales, I think, God, it's just, it must be impossible for the enemy to see that, to see that they're just going to keep coming. And uh, I don't know how I'll survive this day. 
Yeah, I, I think um, what's all some of the, you know, the, there's stories that I think are common to a lot of different wars. And one story that's, that really has always impressed me is the way that in World War One during uh, there was a Christmas Day armistice and uh, the way that the, the soldiers, the respect that they sh- that supposedly the soldiers from, you know, both sides got together, you know, went out to no man's land and shook hands and, you know, had whatever was sale or whatever they were drinking or doing with the, the respect that they showed for, you know, their fellow warriors. Yeah. The men's and, and you do see that I've seen that, um, in, you know, other people that I've known Vietnam veterans, for instance, talking, going back over to Vietnam and, um, you know, meeting, meeting some of uh, some of the men that presumably they, you know, they may have been shooting at and trying to kill because they understand, you know, there, there's a, I guess a great respect for what it takes for that warrior spirit, which I think is what you're talking about, you know, to be there now, do Americans have it more than, than others? I don't know. I I certainly can cite a lot of examples of, you know, Americans who have those, you know, have that spirit. And, And I think partly our system by encouraging kind of individual, uh, rights and expression and and that sort of thing and partly you know our training and stuff encourages that Um, but it's probably you know it's deep within all of us that indomitable spirit you know i think it's probably a a a trait that crosses the human race no matter where you happen to have been born or what exact you know sequence of genes you have deep down somewhere at the base there there is that potential for that you know indomitable spirit Yeah. Yeah. That indomitable spirit is something we had Woody Williams on the show. He's one of the guys that won a medal of honor on Iwo Jima. And he just kept going back to the pillboxes and dumping his flamethrower into the exhaust, you know, the the air holes for those things and just barbecuing the enemy. And, you know, he would, those things had about 90 seconds worth of, of fuel in them. And so he would just, keep get me a new one i'll be right back get me a new, that's just, a long time 90 seconds in front of a uh-huh jet yeah and he, i mean that's some of the most ferocious fighting in the ever 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 <laughs> yeah, ever period. and imagine you know his american peers just watching this guy put himself in harm's way and the japanese knowing that this guy's never going to stop you know yeah. <laughs> just they're they're going to have to kill him and if they don't he will kill every single one of them which he ultimately did he just kept going yeah said i don't think exclusively an american trait there is something to be said for volunteers and and the reason why you fight but these these stories are incredible um, absolutely and i mean you know in our current our current military is all you know all volunteer force and also self-selecting yeah and and, and that may be a factor world war ii now, Ray was a volunteer, but, you know, he had a lot of draftees, uh, same in Vietnam. So, and, you know, so it's hard. I think, you know, like I say, I think that quality is within, potentially within all of or most of us. Yeah. It's just a matter of uh, circumstances and training and maybe the way you were raised, bring it out. As Ray describes, actually, let me ask you this question first. So, uh, uh, the landing at Sicily was yes. that uh, similar to, to Africa, or did they progressively get worse? In, until no, finally- Sic- Sicily is a, Sicily's a, a, a lot worse. The the and I'm talking about the American sectors. The initial landing, you know, coming in from the water and stuff, they are they're under fire. As a matter of fact, a uh, man gets killed in presumably is killed in Ray's boat, but their instructions are not to stop and help him, just get out. We talk about that in the book. Yeah. But what happens is that the the Italians and the Germans launch very ferocious uh, counterattacks very shortly after the American the American units come you know come on shore. And there the Americans are uh, faced with fortunately at different times um, by a very large infantry unit um, and a very uh, of sizable unit of tanks, and they managed to uh, defeat or survive really both both waves. The, the The tank combat is kind of interesting, is you have all along the American sectors in, in kind of different spots. You have the the tanks attacking infantrymen, um, 
you know, who are not, they haven't yet, yet, uh, for the most part, gotten heavy weapons uh, on shore, and uh, and in in the areas near where Ray or where Ray's uh, battalion is, the only what the Americans started to do was make sticky bombs, basically mm. stick them on the side of the the armor, and it would take a couple, but they disable the tank, and or they would let the tanks come through on purpose or not. Yeah. <laughs> through and then the the tanks would be vulnerable to you know to to those sorts of attacks and to, i'm sure there must have been one or two instances where they would have come up you know and, and thrown a grenade into the hatch although that's not really documented in the book but mm. probably did happen when ray's telling you these stories and you're, you're trying to wrap your mind around it do you just keep digging for more details and, and snapshots of his memory or or and then how do you how do you protect against false memories yeah that's that's tricky i i had an advantage in this book in that having done you know having done the omar bradley book bradley did not was not at part of operation torch but he is in africa and is the core commander really when much of the real heavy fighting that Ray gets involved in it was there. So I had a good, and he was Corps commander, uh, Bradley was Corps commander under Patton, the only Corps commander under Patton. Uh, was Patton was his own Corps commander <laughs> for a separate Corps. And I don't know that Patton got along with himself as, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. Corps commander, but that's another story. Fair question. But anyway, Ed Bradley, of course, was, a, you know, was your, uh, the American commander for D-Day. So I already had the architecture laid out of what happened. I mean, then we started by just a bunch of informal talks and, and stuff. And, and then that allowed me to kind of bone up on, you know, where he had been, some of the procedures to do, uh, you know, Basic background research, you know, what kind of equipment did medics carry and, and that sort of thing. And then, you know, and then we had, uh, we were working on a pretty tight timeline. Um, so we had some very long, very long formal sessions where we would go through and we started chronologically to find that that's to let, that lays a good basis uh, for most, for most people. And I would, my general, you know, my general kind of modus operandi is to let the person talk about what they want to talk about and uh, to kind of gently guide them to, you know towards certainly towards more specifics and to um to kind of guide them onto the agenda uh, if they kind of slow down or whatever um what helped in ray's case in terms of because so much time had passed and you know and Memories can get memories kind of, you know, they're fragile things. They can get polluted by movies, by something somebody else said or by this, by that, you know, by wishful thinking. Um, what helped helped us in Ray's case uh, were some of the he had he has a bunch of medical records, um, maps. You know, so we could talk. We knew when certain when people at his unit, for instance, were injured, including when he was, or at least when it was reported, which wasn't always the right thing. And those were really good prompts for him. Uh, photos, good prompts, maps. It's not what I found with Ray's memory is really, really good. Um, it wasn't so much, and this is often the case, it's not so much that somebody's memory is bad. It's just that they know you know, they're not trying to give you every detail. They're not trying to give you the details you really need to write a book. They've, especially someone who, you know, has told the story a few times, they're going to like kind of narrow the story down, yeah. narrow it down, and they'll just hit the highlights, which, you know, is great if you're in a five minute phone conversation. But if you have to write a 85,000 or 100,000 word book, you know, you need a few more details. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, I, I, and and obviously some of them. You know, I don't really need Ray to you know describe what a jeep looked like, but uh, you know, I need him to to tell me what it felt like when he was you know uh, driving, you know driving it. Um, so, you know, so you know, I can get the details on what the jeep looked looked like from a million reference units and you know books and uh, you know that sort of thing. So we're running. It, towards the end of our time and i just i wanted to get some reflection from you because you you like me you gather these incredible stories 
and they sit with you and they change and, and create a new version of you. So what have you, what have you taken away from this book thus far? That it's very possible to, to live to a very, very old age and still be very active and, uh, and, and mentally as well as physically. And um, I'll, I'll tell you what, and I know that this really has nothing to do with what the book theoretically is about, but I have a different view of what old age is now. I mean, it's not now, you know, obviously, you know, you accumulate physical. Sure you know, problems and stuff, but as Ray kept at Ray's still active as hell. And, you know, he just, he just kept, you know, just kept at it, kept doing things, kept involved and stuff. And, and, um, that's my role model going forward. And yeah. if I'm half as uh, crisp as he is when I'm, well, next year, even the hell with 98, you know, I'll be doing well. Um, that I think I, I, you know, it's, and I know that's not what the book's about, but, <laughs> yeah. uh, but that, you know, that was, that was the experience and, uh, it's great. It's inspiring. Uh, you know, working with Ivan Castro, you yeah. know, was, uh, and, uh, fighting blind, which is the name of that book. You know, it was like, okay, we can't, you can do two furs, you know, when you, you can do, you know, two workouts a day and, and still, you know, and still survive. So I do two workouts and now, you know, now from this book, I, I have an inspiration for, you know, where those workouts are going to get me when I'm 90. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I like that. So pretty quickly here, all the World War II living memories, you know, from the, especially from D-Day, they're going to be gone. And I don't know the number of the dudes left from that day that are left, but. There's, there's not too many. There's not, I, 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 you know, I've talked to, and I have talked to a a bunch. They're fortunately, yeah, they're old. They're in their 90s passing away and they're a great resource so if you know somebody that has a you know that was there in the war whether it was d-day or not you know record their story man just yeah just just get it get them to tell you what happened yeah if anybody's got someone in their family or in their circle that 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 want to tell their story i'm glad to uh i'm glad to sit with them and uh and grab them uh when when will the last book or movie or tale about d-day be told though i mean it seems like that it's just an an ever producing well of of incredible jaw-dropping tales well i hope there's room for one more because <laughs> 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 i'm uh, working on it now so we'll oh see. you are working on it now can you talk about well, it we're I, I it's uh we're in the speculative stages okay so. all right well, hopefully there's room for a couple more because you that'll be your third trip to that uh that particular story. And uh I can't wait to hear that. Hey everybody, you should get every man a hero, Ray Lambert's tale, a combat medic, first wave, gate drops, he's right there on D in D Day on Omaha Beach, the hardest beach ever. And I wanted to ask you, because you open in the uh shoot, you know what? I'm gonna buy a couple minutes. You say in the in the open that the general was like, man, we might have to retreat. You know, yeah, that's incredible when you think about well, Bradley that. almost what, what happens is Bradley's not getting the worst thing. The, the second worst thing when you're in a battle is to be getting information that the battle is going poorly. But that's the second worst thing. The worst thing, the most worst thing or very worst thing is to not be getting in for any information from the battlefield, because yeah. what does that mean? Worse. Yeah. They, <laughs> no one's exactly. coming back so, to tell you anything. So you, but here's what Bradley does. So Bradley is out on the Augusta, which is a cruiser, and that's his he, that's his command ship, and he's not getting any information. And he's, you know, what is he going to do? And now, he knows that Utah, that the troops are on Utah, which is the other American beach. And as important as Omaha is for, for a number of reasons, you know, he's faced with possibly sending, you know, thousands more people to their death if he just stays there or you know or his alternative would be to you know to reinforce utah and at least save those guys and maybe you know change plans or what have you so he's not sure what to do so what does he do he does what any good general officer always does he looks around the room finds a captain and says captain go get your butt over there and tell me what the hell's going on yeah 
So um, he sends, uh, actually, he sends one of his aides, a very close aide, uh, to the beach, and they get there in a PT boat, and they don't land, but they, but as they as they kind of get out of the smoke and, and everything, the, uh, the captain sees that there are troops coming up the ridge, American troops climbing up the ridge. He says, that's it. We, you know, we can do this, but we got to get more, but we need all those troops in there. So they race back. Bradley, you know, keeps the invasion going, goes over to the boat where a lot of other generals are and says, get your butts on the, on the beach there. We got to get going. So, uh, and that was really, that's really the turning point at least for the Americans there that people like Ray Lambert and his brother, Bill, were brave enough to you know withstand the fire and just keep going you know against great tremendous odds and they really turned the tide that day was was general roosevelt at omaha or was he at utah teddy jr Mm -hmm. was who actually was ray's division assistant commander general Mm. in africa and in Sicily, Teddy is on Utah, and Teddy's Utah? also okay. a great story. Ted, they land in the they land in the wrong, completely, totally, utterly r- wrong place on Utah, and Teddy kind of Teddy takes charge and and is reputed to have said, and and knowing, you know, if you read any stories about him, you, you know, you totally believe this. It's a one of the the. One of the officers said, you know, we're in the wrong place, and yeah. blah, blah, blah. And Teddy said, that's okay. We'll fight the war from here. And they march, they march through, uh, through, through a swamp and, uh, and you know, and just uh, keep going. They get their objectives. The first day of Utah is, and no invasion, nothing in that war is a picnic, but Utah is relatively, certainly compared to Omaha, is a relatively easy invasion. The tough stuff on Utah happens or in the Utah area happens, uh, you know, after that. But yeah, Teddy was a, Teddy was quite a character. Yeah. And he won the medal of honor that, or he didn't win it. He was awarded the medal of honor for his actions that well, day. You can say you win it, you win it, you're awarded it, you get yeah. it, you're, you know, whatever your verbiage you want to use. God damn it. That's a, that's one hell of an impressive. <laughs> yeah. A general <laughs> who clearly was in ill health, by the way, <laughs> out there swinging a cane, a cane. <laughs> <laughs> She's a, he was a piece of work. He and Terry Allen were. Uh, yeah. Well, Terry Allen had some negatives uh, about it, but uh, uh, they're certainly they're absolutely fun to write about. I'll tell you that. Yeah. Well, listen. Come back when the next thing's ready, and then when you and Ray, if, he, if Ray's on the road with you this time, uh, if you guys come to LA, let me know, and I'll I'll bump up there and uh, come hang out with you guys. Great. That'd be a lot of fun. Thanks for having me on.